Okay, so we start with the second talk for today. I'd like you to welcome John Connell. Uh, John Connell is a composer and he's also the director of the Spatial Sound Collective 4D Sound. So this is the people who developed the sound system that you can experience now throughout the festival when you go to Monom, to the Transcend the Turmoil series, also again it's on tonight and John and uh, fellow artist Florence To also presented a project there on the very first day. It was called Nocturnal and uh, it's an overnight sleep concert. And um, yeah, for d Sound is now based in Budapest and through Monom or through the partnership with Monom also in Berlin and they commission artists to develop work for that sound system, to experiment with that sound system. And I think that's uh, a very promising and interesting field of research that they are doing there. And John, now from that perspective of that experience of that research, will uh, give his talk and speak about why it might be important for us to learn to listen again in new ways and how we might uh, start or begin doing so, I think. Okay, John, welcome. Cool, thank you. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Um, thank you for that introduction, Jan. Um, so this is a talk about uh, elevating the role of uh, listening in culture. Can you maybe turn that down? Yeah. Uh, it's a talk about elevating the role of of listening in culture and thinking about what listening can uh, open up for us as a problem-solving tool uh, as well as an artistic uh, um, um, opportunity. I called the talk Silence Signal Noise. This is part of a series of workshops and talks um, that I've been doing. And maybe some of the, the discussion points here will be uh, self-evident to people working with sound intensively. Um, sometimes I've, I've been presenting this outside of uh, fields working with the sonic arts, but uh, hopefully there's information in here that uh, is pertinent to, to your interest. And why did I call this um, silent signal noise? Well, this is a quote here from a neuroscientist called Seth Horowitz, who's concerned uh, with music, he's also a, a huge music fan. And uh, the quote is, what, what is detectable, what is discernible, and what is relevant are the basis for parsing out raw vibration into silence, signal, and noise. So there's a very uh, a basic or, or rough model for the neuro neurological process involved in what happens when we experience sound or uh, we engage in the process of vibration detection. Um, there, there, there's a, 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 pr a process that we undergo that feels also relevant to us outside of the neurology of, of uh, the brain and the mechanics of listening, but to think about uh, these elements in our society culturally as well. So um, maybe if we think about what these mean in a broader sense, Silence is about having time and space without free, free from uh, stimulation that's necessary to detect uh, the information that we, we're receiving. Signal means uh, uh, determining what's dis dis uh, discernible and, and of value to us and uh, recognizing the patterns within those signals. And noise, of course, is what we term deemed to be irrelevant that should, needs to be filtered and ignored. Um, and why is this important? Well, we live in a, in a, a visually dominated culture. Um, if you think about where you spend most, most of your time in these dense urban conurbations and these very fragmented uh, screen-based mediascapes that we spend the majority of our waking hours on, uh, our dominant uh, sensory medium is, of course, uh, the visual, and sound plays a, a diminished role in this space. And, and this is maybe something that seems self-evident, but I don't think we often consider the implications or the impact that this might have. So 
I wanted to talk a little bit about that and some, some thinking and theories around it. Um, Marshall McLuhan already, um, way back in his time, was, uh, was uh, observing this, this phenomenon happening within, within Western media. Ever since we, we stepped away from the oral tradition and worked with uh, visual mediums of increasing complexity and intensity, we've, we've become an ocular-centric culture. And, and uh, he, uh, McLuhan argued that this was actually a form of hypnosis that, that uh, this engendered. Um, he, he, he termed hypnosis as an assault on one sense that would uh, essentially uh, diminish the, the awareness in, in the other senses. And uh, he went even further to, to consider that this level of uh, hypnotic uh, engagement was arguably even a form of violence, to, to be so overstimulated, to, to have the other sensory uh, uh, levels diminished. And, and he made parallels with, um, with uh, uh, techniques for torture that are used where it uh, uh, can be actually a very, very simple technique, but th uh, over time, as that overstimulation builds, it can create uh, excruciating uh, results. Maybe that's a little extreme for what we see today, but th the question remains, are we overstimulated in the, the, uh, the visual sense? And it, it kind of provides an interesting template to think about certain kinds of think, ways of thinking and feeling that um, maybe we, we are not cognizant of. So he says, Western civilization has been mesmerized by a picture of the universe as a limited container in which all things are arranged according to a vanishing point in linear geometric order. So there's, there's a clearly defined space with borders. And there's, there's something uh, very selective about the nature of vision that this suggests. The human eye appears to be the father of linear logic. Its very nature encourages reasoning by exclusion. Something is either in that space or it isn't. So if you start to consider the implications for that, you, we come to what uh, I've kind of termed here the domination of the divisible. This is, this is the kind of the prominence and importance in our, in our uh, culture for things that, that are discrete and can be uh, um, broken down into quantifiable packets of, of data. Um, and so this notion of the single point focus within the visual, excluding the periphery and, and uh, looking at one particular detail amongst many others. The borders are clearly defined. I think uh, a, a crucial part of vision is about uh, the edge detection within objects. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to navigate the environment. There's something binary in this, this, uh, this relationship with it. It's very definitive and leads to kind of polarized outcomes. There is no in-between. It's either this or it's that. There's, it, it lends itself to a very sequential kind of logic-oriented uh, approach where events must follow events in time and in space. So there's a coherence required that, that basically uh, uh, has no space for the irrational or the illogical. It's linear, there must be a beginning and an end. And, and very crucially, uh, the visual sense can be seen as detached. So it's non-physical, it's something that's happening uh, um, um, within, within the mind in a way that the, the listening sense is not, which we'll talk about in a second. And it's selective, you can close your eyes, you don't need to, to see what you're seeing in front of you, which is not the case with the, the listening sense. This opens up an entirely other field of experiential possibility. So it's discontinuous. If you think about your, your auditory experience, it's not, uh, what you're hearing is, is not necessarily uh, consistent. Uh, the sounds may emerge from all around you. Uh, it's, it's truly immersive in that it's uh, physical and visceral and multi-directional coming from all directions. It's free in as much as sound penetrates boundaries in a way that light does not. Uh, it's, it's more of an open uh, 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 sense than the visual because while it can be localized, it, it also is almost explicitly about the peripheral and, and taking in information from all directions. And you could argue that it, it kind of encourages the irrational. There's, while the mechanics are, are clearly rational and, and, and logic driven, 
there's an emotional immediacy that comes from the, our, our relationship with sound that uh, allows us to circumnavigate very rational modes of thought. And this, you know, this is this is kind of a philosophical point again, but sound can bring us closer to the thresholds of the known. So if the visual is about definition and, and uh, uh, clarity and, and discreteness, sound is about the in-betweenness, the, the spaces between the, 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 the objects that we recognize, the negative space and the potential within those spaces. So Pauline Oliveros uh, re referred to um, the things at the edge of the new. So there's this, this perception at the edge of the new, things that we know and, and something that lies behind that. So there's a liminality that the, the, the auditory uh, encourages that we recognize something is there and by refining our capacity to experience that, we, may, we might be able to breach that, uh, that boundary. So I want to talk a little bit about what, what we think of as listening. Uh, in essence, this is the act of attention. It's about uh, bringing uh, uh, acuity to the moment as it unfolds moment to moment. So clearly, there are parallels there with, with the meditative disciplines uh, and any practices exploring uh, uh, awareness. It's also the oldest sense, uh, if you think about the, ex the process of uh, vibration detection. This is something that's shared with the earliest life forms and the most primitive life forms who were, uh, in, in which vibration detection was uh, an, an, a, f a form of exploratory threat and opportunity response. So this is the lineage that we're, we're, we're connected to when we think about what it means to perceive vibration in a physical way. Uh, and you know, if thinking about this time frame kind of helps us step out of, of a very kind of partisan, uh, uh, human-oriented, uh, uh, um, uh, objective-driven mindset, given some practice. It's something that's inherently spatial in nature, and this is something that we've uh, occupied ourselves with quite intensively at 4D Sound. So the, inf the information that you're receiving uh, from, from sound uh, allows you to p build up a picture of, of like incredible levels of detail that we're not cognitively aware of. It can tell us about the, the distance and size of objects. It can tell us about the, 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 the texture and character of, of its surfaces, of the angles and the dimensions of those surfaces. It, it lets us know about the, the behavior of objects and the energy of those objects in a space uh, in a very complex range of psychoacoustic attributes. So if you think about it, and if, if people have experience working with med med meditation, listening to a space and beginning to identify the movements that are around you uh, can become extremely complex. You're able to, to start picking out information such as uh, the fluctuation of a movement and how an object's accelerating or, 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 or decelerating. Uh, whether that object is ex expanding or, 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 or uh, decreasing in size. So it's an incredibly rich and complex form of uh, extracting information from uh, our, uh, our environment. It's also the primary source, arguably, of language and music. So this is uh, uh, archaeo uh, archaeoacoustics, is, is quite a, re a relatively new field of study, but there's, there's recent uh, research which is kind of shedding a light on the decisions, uh, the decision-making processes behind our early spaces. So this is, uh, this is a cave, uh, a grotto in uh, Os Ossetania in France, and 35,000 years ago, uh, um, er earlier men and women were exploring these spaces either by torch or in, in complete darkness, and they were using sound as their guide to, to explore these, these spaces. And when we look at the patterns in how uh, early cave paintings were uh, um, um, placed, these were not randomly um, placed. They were, they were often of places of uh, clear acoustic significance, uh, places where, which had a very precise natural echo that uh, correlated to, 
um, particular uh, frequencies and resonances that had some significance to the people that lived within them. And when you, uh, and my colleague at 4D Sound, Paul Oman, is, is uh, involved in uh, two or three projects related to this. But this, when you think about the emergence of uh, language through sound, you begin to recognize how that would be shaped by the spaces that we were in, and also the emergence of the, the sublime and the spiritual because you know, even in a space like this, with its specific uh, acoustical characteristics, or you think about uh, a cathedral and the reverence that, that, uh, that the, the impulse response on an on a, uh, acoustic signal makes, uh, it, has, it has a clear and immediate uh, effect on the body. And so, uh, being able to navigate with with these senses is a huge part of, of uh, how we evolved our cultures and our spiritual traditions. And to think then, in that era, just how developed and advanced our capacity to navigate and, and uh, engage with that kind of acoustic detail would be. Do we have that anymore? That, that I would question. So this is a stock image of meditation. Uh, trumpet is optional, but there's there's something interesting in the uh, um, the spiritual exploration and use of sound, and of course many spiritual traditions through through the, the centuries have experimented with uh, um, um, meaning in in sound, such as in the mantra, uh, but but also the, the 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 inquiry discipline of listening using listening as a reflective tool to understand external and internal uh, information has, has been uh, um, something explored by many, many different traditions. And uh, I've also had my experience with this, and this has been a very strong uh, inspiration for some of the, uh, the ideas that we've explored. So if you think of uh, the, the tradition of Vipassana, for example, this is 10 days of complete silence uh, working with body scanning, which is essentially a, uh, an internal mental listening uh, process, uh, um, which is ma married with uh, uh, walks in silence outside, that, that begins to uh, uh, essentially reframe and uh, heighten our capacity to extract information from that experience, whether that's in the external or the internal. And as you, as you go deeper into that, uh, increasingly uh, precise levels of information start to become self-evident. So why is that important to us? Well, if you think about, I don't know if anyone has had experience of this, but if, if uh, after three hours of meditation, your leg goes completely numb and then it becomes excruciatingly painful, that would be the point at which you would want to stand up and leave. But when you actually apply the, the, the principles of that practice to the physical experience you're having in the moment, you're able to recognize that the, the, the psychological uh, uh, labeling that, that you have as pain in your leg is actually uh, made of, uh, it's basically a composite of many other associations. And by delving into that and just observing them dispassionately, your notion of what that pain is uh, begins to dissolve and change. So it becomes uh, an incredibly effective tool for, for uh, um, problem solving uh, dis in a dispassionate sense that, and, and essentially lead you to the, the ability to uh, respond to crisis or trauma or conflict uh, from a very different perspective. Now that seems to me like something that's increasingly crucial given the, uh, the, the sense of discord and grow, growing uh, un, unrest that we, we intuitively feel about what's happening around us at uh, political level, uh, economically, uh, you know, environmentally, and, and also to enable us to apply uh, a, a, a way of engaging with uh, very crucial tasks or cr crucial issues that we haven't found a way to uh, actively engage with. Otherwise, we would be doing, we'd be doing it already. 
So these are the questions that we're asking ourselves. How might our abilities develop if we fully refine those capacities? Is it possible to actually develop these and accelerate that process? And what impact would that have on how we build our environments, the interactions that we create between us, and our, our own understanding of ourselves as experiencing organisms, which at the moment, I think, uh, it remains very crude. You know, we are, the impact that we're having uh, on, on our, our ourselves and other, other life forms is, is catastrophic, ar arguably, and yet we consider ourselves intelligent enough to, to uh, uh, be the most dominant species on the planet. So, so there is a disconnect there, and we haven't found a solution, and I'm suggesting that the, uh, the, the listening sense needs to play a crucial role in that moving forward. But our, our physical spaces are not designed to help us do that. They're completely awash with noise. Um, the, the academic and, and uh, experimental sound artist R. R. Murray Schaefer was outlining this in the 70s with his concept of universal deafening. So when we're living in an urban environment, we're living with a baseline level of sound that's in the region between 50 and 60 decibels in many places. And this correlates to a sense of disquiet that it's a, a, a constant uh, stimulation of the nervous system, and, and uh, this can often lead to, to levels of anxiety and dis-ease. And we fight this fire with fire. We create this negative feedback loop because we stick our earbuds in, we, f we fill our public spaces with music that we turn up louder and louder, and we essentially uh, extinguish any opportunity for silence. Silence has almost become like a stigma, you know, in our, in our, in our uh, public spaces and in our conversations. It's not comfortable to sit with silence, and, and so it almost becomes something that we're not able to, to, to work with in a meaningful way anymore. And the result of this is that we create more noise. We, we're literally losing the capacity to uh, identify certain kinds of frequencies because anything under that level of decibel becomes irrelevant to us from a, an audio ecological standpoint. We often see this in uh, the patterns in uh, um, uh, uh, ecological environments where birds leave um, extremely noisy areas because they, they literally can't hear themselves anymore. So it's, it's a, it continues in, in a negative feedback loop. And, this may feel like a little bit of a jump as an analogy, but this noise is... I think our media scapes are essentially uh, echoes of our physical environments. So, you know, we spend the majority of our waking hours uh, on, on, a, on a very uh, complex, astonishingly uh, um, uh, uh, powerful um, kind of raft of different worlds, but these, they're, they're, there's a great incoherence within that, and there's, they're, they're built primarily on the attention economy principle. So in these spaces, which are corporate-owned, and I think we're all aware of this, your consciousness is for sale, essentially. People want your time and they want your attention. There's some kind of financial imperative from that, or there's an opportunity to, uh, to extract data for which there will be an, a commercial opportunity further down the line. I, I think everyone's aware of that, uh, and there's no easy solution to that, of course, but it is having an impact on our, our capacity to engage with each other, because the, the lingua franca of these spaces is not deep connection, it's uh, it's immediacy over depth, the death, the death of journalism. It's about shock over nuance. It's really like uh, um, you know, hitting our, our dopamine cir uh, reward circuits to, to uh, ensure that we're engaged at, on, on a constant level, so we're, we're jacked uh, in this experience. It's about sound, sound bites over narrative, so hot takes, immediate responses that are not reflective of what's happening convenience over quality, we make the shortest route possible rather than taking the time. And I think there's, there's a knock-on effect on this. We want the, the quickest, fastest thing uh, uh, um, as, as possible, and we've kind of lost interest in the tangential or the, the, the anything that isn't immediate. It starts to become irrelevant and therefore 
uh, anything that could be communicated to those mediums or processes uh, is lost. And it's literally changing not just our state from moment to moment, it's changing how our brains function because uh, one person referred to this as the, the altered state economy. You're, you're, you're being, your reward circuits are constantly being uh, triggered, whether that's a like or a comment uh, um, or, or some other interaction that is basically at a neurological level the same, uh, same thing as what's happening with, with a drug addict. I, I'm not, I don't want to paint, paint like an overly negative picture because clearly uh, you know, socialized, uh, networked technology is transformational and exceptionally powerful. But I think we're, we're, we need to really consider the impact of the dynamics of these spaces and where it's taking us when we recognize that attention spans are dropping, particularly in younger people, because they're front-loading huge amount of information and then the attention just drops away. And clearly this has an impact on our capacity for exchange for certain kinds of, of media consumption. Uh, and it's, it's contributing to this idea where once we had information poverty, we're now in a state of information avoidance, where we're just we're, we're selecting our own reality by deliberately avoiding crucial information that threatens how we feel because the, the, the flood is just too much to, to deal with. So, where does sound fit into this environment? Principally, I would argue sound in a networked uh, media space is uh, a form of pres prescriptive emotional enhancement. And, and back in the, the 30s, I think it was, Adorno, who was, wor who was working in the film industry in Hollywood, uh, uh, outlined this, this notion of the rationally planned uh, irrationality of, of, of music and the arts is the very essence of the, the amusement industry. So you begin to see patterns uh, of very homogenized content, it's ubiquitous, you see the same things over and over again. It's invasive, there's nowhere to leave. It's very programmatic, it's formulaic, and it's, ex it's, it's uh, expected. If you think about the emotional resonance afforded in soundtracks, as an example, or the, 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 uh, the, the urgency that's inferred by um, a social media app um, and sound design, or, of course, the programmatic approach to, to very intense visceral sounds in a lot of electronic music, particularly more commercial uh, aspects of that. So we're losing silent spaces. The, the sound that we're working with is very programmatic and, and homogenous in many ways. And the next stage is both really exciting and quite uh, frightening, depending on how you look at it. We're at the cusp of the age of immersive technologies that are truly seamless. So, where you're, you're not, in 20 years, the technologies will be there, I'm, I'm, I'm certain, where you're not even aware that you're in uh, a, a defined space that's seamlessly connecting st uh, streams of information from different sources to feed your, uh, your, your experience. So, this is owned by uh, um, big corporate organizations who clearly have commercial interests in your time in these spaces, inevitably, of course. But what, what, what comes next with this is something that I, I think we really need to, to consider because now we can see the edges and we can be cognizant of the processes, but as we move into something that's deeply immersive, we're not conscious of the echo chamber or, or the, 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 the algorithms that are essentially structuring our entire experience without, without our knowledge. And this is a very different thing. So what is the role for sound in this immersive media? Is there a way for sound to play a different role within these spaces? Can we use the principles within uh, um, our ideas about sound and listening to create healthier spaces that have better ratios of, of silence, of signal, and of noise. And, and as a field, uh, the field of sonic arts and, and experimental music, 
can we become more actively involved in developing what are essentially corporate-owned spaces or creating our own? And you know, I think what we're seeing with something like the decentralized uh, power movements, such as the, the uh, blockchain, our, our attempts to explore this in our own way, we're also seeing gold rush mentality within these spaces to accumulate vast sums of wealth, which is exactly what happened with the origins of the internet, a utopian platform that was designed for, for connection and uh, um, uh, enabling people to, to communicate and, and learn became the foundation for you know, the most powerful commercial engine that we've ever uh, known. So I think these are really crucial questions and I can't tell you what the answer to these are, but I do believe that listening plays a role in this. I think to be present as a listener is, is something truly revolutionary. To be present in the moment and be actually able to retain uh, 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 your own awareness and not be distracted or pulled away by other interests is a form of, of uh, control, self-control, and, 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 and a stand against uh, too much noise. So we, I think we really need to approach the act of listening and the new listening technologies that are emerging as, as radical tools for transformation rather than entertainment vehicles that are just going to feed the status quo. And this is something that we have been thinking about quite extensively at 4D Sound. Um, and this, this kind of forms the basis of what we would call an ecology of listening. This is about a systemic approach to using sound and sound technologies and listening as a discipline to create healthier spaces that uh, uh, encourage different kinds of communication and exchange and creative uh, expression. And very simply, this is about the sound of our spaces, uh, the, our ability to listen to those spaces effectively, to cultivate new awareness of those spaces and create better spaces as that uh, um, attention and, and understanding evolves. And we're already seeing this happen with the kind of uh, performances and projects that we're uh, um, uh, experimenting with and presenting at 4D Sound and uh, at, at the, the, our institute in Budapest and with our, our uh, colleagues and partners at Monom in uh, the Funk House who, who have just opened the space uh, uh, literally about two months ago. So we're, we see a shift from short listening formats into much longer durational performances, a shift from uh, excessively loud concerts to refined listening environments that don't create any uh, physical damage to the listener. Um, moving, moving away from linear directive narratives into kind of choose your own adventure, multi-directional interpretative experiences that take quite some getting used to uh, initially, but actually allow a huge amount of freedom and a an entirely different way of engaging with, with the medium. Uh, also shifting from passive experiences into a much more participative, interactive dynamic and encouraging a much more collective and social listening experience. So I'm going to go through a few examples of the projects at play that hopefully uh, illustrate uh, what we've been working on. And I would love to know your thoughts on, on these and any questions that come up. So thinking about this, listening needs time and space to emerge. Uh, cultivating listening as a discipline takes time. It's something that needs to be uh, uh, um, built and developed. And, and creating experiences and methodologies to do that is part of what we're exploring. So as an example of what would come out of that, this was uh, our presentation at ZKM two years ago with the uh, field recording specialist and curator Alisa Moxley, who really works with uh, um, rooting a listener in, in, uh, in locality. So she'll work with uh, integrated field recordings that come from uh, real places and, and kind of transplants them or, or inter integrates them into each other. And it's a very like grounding experience that 
uh, to the casual listener in a, if on, on a 30 second pass. We actually do very little, but uh, over time evolves into uh, a deeply engaging experience that brings up many questions about uh, uh, location and your connection with those and, the, and an emotional sensitivity that emerges from that. Mark Fell was also an artist we worked with and the, the, the composition that he developed for us was from the outside actually had very little detail but it's really working with the, the, the micro sensibilities of perception and once you begin to sit with the um, the the fact that it's not going to deliver on your expectation of what the piece should do. It's almost like passing through uh, a boundary and then the, the piece really begins to open up. And there's something quite uh, uh, powerful in this that I think is, re is, is relevant, is to just accept that what you're ex about to experience is not going to deliver on predetermined expectations opens up the power of, of the, the, the performance. Uh, Robert Litoff is uh, an educator and uh, 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 a coach working with voice and he's also developing methodologies around listening and the, the embodied nature of, of, of sound and how, uh, uh, how listening must incorporate the physicality of the experience and also uh, the, the relational aspect of where you are in a space and, and the relations to others. So building formats like this is also part of what we're uh, exploring. Listening can also help us uh, explore new intelligent uh, social spaces. This is a piece called Astrocyte that uh, was designed by the architect Philip Beasley and the Living Architecture Systems Group. Um, in, in Toronto, of which 4D Sound is, is, is a, a partner. Uh, and the sound design was done by 4D Sound partner Salvador Breed. So this is uh, an interactive installation and environment which is encouraging uh, a different kind of uh, um, form and response from the, uh, the visitor and the space. It's essentially working with 300,000 custom uh, components uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of evolving soundscape, a light and soundscape, that can be navigated in very different ways. It can be done purely through the auditory sense with the eyes closed. It can be done through the, watching the, the, the fields of light. It, it experiments with, with the tactile nature of, of uh, what's possible within an environment. And this kind of points in the direction of what we might be able to start developing uh, when we, we think of our spaces as intelligent entities in and of themselves. They're embedded with with responsive and adaptive technologies and they, they enable us to engage with them and even develop empathic relations with, with the space. Here's some more examples of the textures of that. So listening also demands a, a kind of participation and an intimacy. Now this is uh, Gaika. Gaika performed uh, last night and the night before at Monom. He's a, he's a South London-based artist uh, working with a lot of ideas of hybridity, uh, fusing different um, styles together. And uh, this was an interpretation of, of his recent uh, piece, which is essentially a, a dystopic sci-fi uh, novel or, sto or story that uh, um, really examines uh, urban degradation, high density uh, housing, race uh, and time travel. What, what's powerful about the, the way that he set this up was uh, he, he was placed in the center of the space, so he's completely surrounded by an audience, and it allows a level of um, participation which uh, is very disarming and even in uncomfortable. So there's no stage, there's no audience, and, uh, uh, one, audience on one side, part, um, uh, artist on the other, it's fully immersive and it encourages and even demands uh, an exchange that wouldn't necessarily happen in a different kind of setup. Listening requires new types of musical language, so there's, there's a need for new semantics starting to emerge from this process. Uh, as we begin to think about uh, sound and space 
in new terms, we need, to, we need a new semantics to actually identify the patterns within that. So this, there's two pieces here that, that, that uh, there's some parallels in exploring. This is from uh, uh, I, Ivan uh, Sapozyov, as, um, who is a Russian sound uh, researcher. And he spent six months with us exploring the notion of the hyperspace. Uh, um, uh, essentially four-dimensional or, or higher levels uh, uh, geometric structures that can be experienced uh, through, through our sensory faculties but nevertheless are there. And, and by blurring the boundaries using uh, sound uh, constructed in, in a, a spatial system, we were able to glimpse or, or almost break through the, the illusory boundaries of our three-dimensional sensory constructs. And, you know, there's a lot that could be said about the, um, uh, the, the whether, whether we're able to actually conjure such shapes in space with the technologies we have. But what's very clear is that very, uh, uh, an extremely visceral uh, musical form has emerged from, from his experiments. And uh, this is from uh, Rona Geffen's sound is the scenery. This is also exploring notions of sonic geometry and how sound propagates through space. And um, she's, she's working with realizing um, these, these shapes in, in physical space. And we've also conducted some early experiments with a neuroscientist to uh, look at the response in, uh, in uh, an audience when they experience these uh, fully spatially realized geometric structures as opposed to a two-dimensional uh, version of that. And it's too early for us to really communicate uh, the results, but they're actually very surprising and they're, they're very consistent in what we've seen. It would suggest that there's, there is a, a, a clear unconscious recognition of the difference between uh, a, a spatially uh, structured sound and uh, a, a two-dimensional sound image. The implications for that are not yet clear, but it does uh, demonstrate that these experiments have some kind of uh, uh, direct and immediate effect on the listener. And then the final thing to, to bring up is how listening and working with space opens up new forms and formats. So this is uh, this is my project with the, the visual artist Florence To, called Nocturnal. And uh, our idea with, with this was to experiment with uh, the sleep concert idea, uh, essentially bringing people into a space uh, overnight and uh, allowing them to have their own sensory uh, relationship with the sound as they drift between waking and dreaming through a, a, a very abstract set of, of waves and static and field recordings, uh, um, which, which I, mi I mix live and, and Florence is also evolving in terms of uh, the, the field of light. And working with three or four projectors, when you're inside the space, it's a truly immersive field. And this notion uh, of, of the, this, the mental state within this dream, where we refer to as the hyper lucid, because it's one of the few remaining states, arguably, that hasn't been polluted with uh, external inputs. It's a, it's a space for, for uh, processing of experience. It's also a space that we're able to, to, to lesser or greater degrees consciously navigate with some ex experience. And the rules in this space are completely different from normal waking reality. They're associative, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're very uh, emotionally oriented, there's, there's very clear symbolic references that, that, that can be communicated. And so to, to work with people in that state almost becomes like a new medium in its own way because the material that you can use when someone's in that, that state uh, it's completely different. Just working with, uh, you know, shifting the, the delay pattern on a, on a, a, a voice moving uh, uh, at altitude 
starts to create kind of synesthetic responses in, in, a, in a, uh, the listener who's able to engage with that. And this clearly has the potential to explore um, new ways of, of creating art forms, but also new, new levels of awareness within that state. So it's, this is exciting ground for, uh, for us, and it's something that we're continuing to, to develop. We've also looked at uh, a range of um, um, ways to experiment with manifesting people's experiences in real time in, in the space. And this is, I think, the next stage for what we want to do. If people can actually interact in a meaningful way with information that comes from someone's dreaming experience. It could be a, a, a very fertile uh, a way of exploring new communicative techniques. So I'm going to finish there. Um, we're continuing the, the research that we're developing and artistic practices at the Spatial Sound Institute in Budapest. Uh, we're very interested in hearing from people who are interested in exploring spatial sound and other kinds of uh, immersive technologies. Monom, our partners here, are, are uh, uh, pushing forward with uh, a really ambitious um, performance-based program this year. So I hope, I hope there is some scope for discussion in there uh, and, and hopefully some new ideas. Uh, thank you very much. Is it worth asking any questions? Does anyone have burning questions, disagreements, think? Hi. Thank you, John. Um, I have one question that I'm also dealing or struggling in my research. As, um, as you mentioned about, I mean, I, don't you think listening is also too personal? Um, especially, I mean, last week was after my second time in nocturnal, my experience, I kind of turned back again to thinking about what is my experience in that space in this determined time and or the, my friend next sleeping next to me. Yes. And this always goes back to my research, which I'm doing an acoustic ecology that everybody's um, understanding of sound, especially in public space, is different. So I can't overcome, like, as a researcher, you know, my experience about that sound. I can write about it, but then maybe the person that who reads and he experiences is totally different. So how you? For example, for in the case of nocturnal, you, well, how you approach to this, like everybody's experience and, and the differences of of the feeling mm. or sensation or listening, basically. Yeah, yeah I th I think it's it's a really important point that listening is uh, very dis disarming in that way, and I think people also have different relationship with listening. Some people maybe have more uh, developed sense. Or, or diminished sense through experiences that they've had. Um, but there are also universalities that we can see um, in how people respond to certain kinds of uh, uh, sonic stimulus. Um, and it, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think, you know, it, different people, I think it depends on at which point you're, you're, you're at in uh, exploring some of these questions about uh, intimacy and communication. And uh, for me, nocturnal was kind of like an inevitable step because I'd already been actively exploring different meditative practices. And there was already some pretty crazy <laughs> uh, kind of energetic exchanges within that. And, and, and actually, one of the inspirations came from a coll a collective dreaming workshops which is really about learning to be comfortable in a, in a shared space and, and, and being able to access a, a part of yourself which isn't normally even shared publicly in public. And of course, you know, things, there, there, there could be real challenges within that. 
someone might have a, like an extremely difficult experience uh, or, or access something that they were not comfortable or, or capable of dealing with. So I don't really know the answer to that. I think, I think it's this, this, when you take the, the, the wheels off, the, you know, the rails off, uh, and start to uh, encourage more participative experiences that are less directive, they're less about a commoditized, a productized form, like a concert, there's, all, there's, going to be, there's going to be experiences that make people uncomfortable or they, they have like an incredibly intense response to because it's no longer in the field of entertainment. It's actually in the field of self-discovery and, and even social exchange. So I think as, as long as we can kind of approach the, the, the projects we do with that spirit and encourage people to, to do the same, uh, I, I think you just take it one project at a time. But I, inevitably there will be people who have very different experiences from that. And we, we see that all the time already. I, I hope that kind of answers the question. And I think it's also just about localizing it as well. You know, if there's small, I mean, Nocturnal is an example of one. What we'd really like to do is have workshops, mm -hmm. you know, in, in different countries where people are exploring that kind of format. And I guess people do do that with sleep concerts already. So there's a community aspect of that as well. Anything else? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I think there's a very important and uh, progressive philosophy behind this uh, whole project. And I'd like to ask whether there is a repetition plan for a nocturnal, for example, uh, because otherwise it's staying a quite exclusive um, event or experience for people. Did you say did you say a repetition point? Yeah, yeah we we would really like to present it multiple times this year, and and open it up, you know, because I, you know inevitably with a technology like spatial sound that's proprietary in in the current stage, it, it is by definition exclusive because most people are never going to get the chance to experience it or or artists work with it, and that's you know. That's just where we are at the moment, and what we really want to do is proliferate that and encourage as many people as possible to experiment with the, the possibilities of it. So yeah, this, this year we, we would really like to present it again. Great. Thank you. Last question. Anything? Um, I think you mentioned <coughs> the um, loss of the oral tradition at some point. Um, are you aware of any renewed interest in reviving oral tradition as a sort of middle ground between literature and, and, and sonic art? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting thing, actually. I, I haven't heard of anything that is exploring... Uh, um, no, this is a short answer. I, I mean, I, I would really like to see that. I'd be very curious to what form that would take, you know, and whether it would need to be quite hard line, because you're, if you want to revive that oral tradition, it means that you don't, you don't record it or capture it on, on any kind of, you know, written or visual media. Uh, certainly, I think just presence, in a way, is a kind of extension of that. You know, being somewhere, have, being present in an experience that can't be re replicated or, 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 doc, or documented uh, and, and kind of giving that experience your time and attention in many ways is in the same spirit as the, those oral um, traditions to me. But yeah, th that would be something really cool to explore. Cool. Oh, yes, please. No, just came to mind to me with this question that of course there's people now that predict or suggest that with new technologies such as Alexa, you know, these kind of AI assistants, assistants, then we might switch to a kind of auditory interaction with the computer world, mm -hmm. basically, with our online worlds, with all of that, and kind of eventually shift away from 
the screen. So I haven't thought about that further than this comment now, but maybe in regards of what you were talking about, have you, have you thought about that angle, like <coughs> what shift that could also make? Of course, that's all language-based at the moment, but who knows, maybe it also be able to shift that more on emotion detection and kind of non uh, syntax kind of expressions, or, or, you know, audible expressions. Don't know. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, there's been many times. It's already starting to happen. You know, like I'm, if you're working with two, like an iPad and a laptop, you kind of want to take information over. And there's been many times where I just wanted to record a presentation and have it dictate. And I know that technology already exists, but it's it's already starting to to manifest. And I think with as 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 the Internet of Things is embedded with increasingly uh, smart uh, computers, we'll start to see that kind of exchange. You'll be talking to your fridge, and it'll be recording and preempting through through uh, the information that it receives, you know, even tonally or or, or um, uh, through a, a range of other other factors um, to kind of make seamless processes uh, 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 work. I, and to me, you know, I think that's quite exciting, and maybe it's inevitable. I, I, I have some concerns about that as well, because once, once you're having like an active, verbal dialogue with the machines, there's a, a certain boundaries kind of is is broken there. And yes, when it starts to become non-verbal, uh, or 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 even kind of offering up different kinds of uh, verbal communication that aren't in play at the moment. So you, yeah, it may even be it starts to change our language because there's you know there's simpler ways to communicate than than uh, forming full sentences. If if the Alexa knows that on three you know three thirty on a Thursday you want to order a particular thing, you just need to say that one thing and suddenly our <laughs> our language begins to kind of kind of shrink because there's no need to to communicate at such complexity. I don't I I don't know to be honest. I, I'm, I'm certain that these systems are, are being developed already, and it's not like I believe there's any grand evil plan behind it. I just think it's in inevitable that uh, big org organizations want direct access to, to you as a consumer, and they'll create as, as uh, effective um, tools and techniques to make that a reality. You know, so I, I, fe I feel like if we have a role, we need to think about how to use those technologies uh, in a different way, so that at least there's some kind of uh, uh, balance of the silence, the signal, and the noise. Cool. Thank you very much.